everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Across the Table, What Legal Departments and Law Firms Can Learn About Each Other, Part 2. I'm Kate Fries, Meeting Manager at LVN. This Legal Value Network webinar is presented in collaboration with the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. The Legal Value Network's mission is to accelerate evolution in the legal industry. LVN connects business of law professionals from law firms, corporate legal departments, alternative legal service companies, and technology providers who are focused on designing, building, and implementing the foundations of a more contemporary and commercially sound model of legal service delivery. Flock is a global community of experts focused on redefining the business of law by helping legal operations professionals collaborate with each other and with other industry players, including law firms, technology providers, and law schools. CLOCK works to help set industry standards and practices for the profession. Before we get started, I would like to go through a few housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded. We are using Zoom webinar, therefore attendees will be muted. We encourage you to use both the chat and Q&A features found on your Zoom controls throughout the session. Now, I would like to introduce Sean Gross, Director of Pricing and Legal Project Management at Constangi, Brooks, Smith, and Profit. Sean? Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you everybody to uh, joining us as you can see, and especially for those who attended last week, this is part two of a two-part series. And uh, the, the goal of our, our series across the table is for us to have both legal departments and legal ops uh, be able to ask the questions that they think are more important that they want to know. So for anyone who saw last week, we had uh, legal ops at the table uh, answering questions. And we're gonna do a similar format uh, this week uh, with, with law firms. And so let me first introduce our, uh, our panelists. We have Teresa Bolt, who's the administrative partner and general counsel at Constangi Brooks Smith and Profit. And we have Jared Applegate, who's the chief legal op operations officer at Barnes and Thornburg. And we were going to have Matt Walquist, a free drinker, Unfortunately, Matt was not able to join us uh, last minute uh, today, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll try and do the, uh, the heavy lifting without Matt, uh, but I will give him credit across the table, that, that title name, to make it collaborative. That was Matt's idea, so I have to give him a, a shout out for that. So what we're going to do similar to last week is uh, we have a series of questions that, that have come from people in legal ops that they want to know from law firms. So we're going to use menti.com. And you can see the code up there on the screen. So we're gonna have a, a, a series of slides that will have questions. So I would greatly appreciate if, if you all as attendees would go over to menti.com, uh, punch in the, this code 550-7745, and you will see questions. And we ask you to pick the top two out of those three. Uh, and we'll do this on each slide. And we're going to make this kind of a, a somewhat free-flowing discussion. So whichever topics you all pick um, as, as your top priorities, that's what we're going to answer. Um, and, you know, if, if it seems appropriate, we'll go back and answer one from before, tackle a couple of them together. Uh, again, we want to make this, this kind of free-flowing, which, of course, makes it more dangerous for us. So, you know, we're, we're taking that risk on. And... Uh, if you see or have any other questions that we did not get to, uh, by all means, use the Q&A or the chat feature uh, and, and you know, feel free to ask any questions that you have. Again, if we haven't covered something and you really want to know, please put it in there and ask us. So I'm hopeful that my screen share works better than it did last week. I'm going to go ahead and display the, uh, the votes as they're coming in. And sure enough, just like last week, when I try and share it, it, it just doesn't want to do it right away. It took a couple of times each time to do it. All right. <laughs> Good. So looks like we have a fairly evenly distributed. Um, and we'll, we'll give a few more seconds to let everybody else, whoever has not yet voted, to do so. All right, well, 
we'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, if that voting changes, we'll stop mid-sentence now. So looks like the top one is, in what ways do firms consider succession planning? Um, tell you what, Teresa, I'm going to put you in the hot seat on this first one. Um, so what, what do you think about that? Yeah, hi, everybody. This is Teresa Bolt. And um, as Sean said, I'm the administrative partner and general counsel for Constanji Brooks Smith and Profit. Um, I actually am housed in Nashville, Tennessee, even though our main office is in Atlanta. Um, our firm does um, employment and labor law um, across the United States. So um, in, and in my role, I've been in this role. Well, I'm not in this role. I've been with the firm for 26 years and in this role for about um, 17 or 18 years. So, um, so I've seen a lot of stuff in my firm and then a lot of the different organizations I've been involved in um, to kind of get a feel for, for what's going on out there in other firms as well. So hopefully um, you'll hear obviously more about my experience, but, um, but I do um, have some experience um, uh, along with the others in terms of the, um, you know, what's going on out there. So um, so in terms of what a firm's doing with succession planning, succession planning, it, 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 as I've read up on it and talked through with a lot of people, mean a couple of different things. One is it's succession planning for the business itself. Um, and the other piece of the succession planning would be firm leadership, like who's going to take over um, in the various administrative roles and the managing partner roles and stuff like that. But, but the primary thing that people are talking about with succession planning is what is going to happen to the clients and what's going to happen to the business when um, these attorneys who have these strong client relationships end up uh, moving um, into their into retirement and or, or whatever it may be. Um, and so a lot of different firms, they struggle with this um, because, you know, if you guys are in-house, you're listening, um, it sounds like we've got a, a good group of in-house and a group of um, law firm as well. Um, the, um, you know, that you, if you're at in-house, you probably love the person you work with. That's what it ends up happening so often is you have a great relationship um, with your relationship partner. Um, and so, you know, the person doesn't want to go to you and say, look, you can no longer work with me. You've got to start working with other people. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, if everybody kind of stops and thinks about it, they realize it's in your best interest as well as theirs to have somebody else there who could pick everything up and take it and run with it and understand your business just like somebody else does. Um, and so, and the firm understands that as well. So it's, um, you know, so, so different firms do different things. Our firm does a senior um, status program for our partners where we say you can take senior status for a couple of years before you move on or a few years before you move out into retirement. I know some firms do mandatory retirement programs. Some do mandatory de-equitization equitization programs where they try to get people to understand that they're moving on with the equity and usually interspersed in that are some incentives for handing off your clients at an earlier stage and some are even better at like going back 10 years and saying look let's look ahead and go your retirement you're going to retire at 65 or whatever it is um, let's look 10 years back and go who is it that's going to be somebody you can really see if it's going to connect with your client and try and experiment maybe the client hates them um, and so you need a little bit of time to make sure that that's going to happen. So long and short, it's, it's a tough topic, I think, for a lot of firms, just because um, these, you know, attorney relationships and client relationships are so relationship driven. Um, and so you really just have to make sure that there's the right fit there. Jared, you have yeah, thoughts on that? Yeah, and I can piggyback on um, Teresa's thoughts, you know, from a client perspective, you know, what we find from a succession planning is how do we then seed in, you know, what I would consider generational gaps, right? So as we work with clients and law firms and clients work together, there's going to be generational gaps. And so we think about it in terms of like relationship seeding, right? So you're connecting, um, you know, those generations together of folks who maybe started the relationship together. And then, you know, they've, uh, those two individuals have two, you know, number twos, um, that exists or number threes or fours who are working, you know, actively on those files. And, you know, it's a good point for both groups and both parties to think about that, right? From a succession plan, who, who's the next up? You know, how can we build relationships that are deeper than, you know, one person, you know, one lead attorney and one general counsel? Uh, and a lot of those things have to do with, um, you know, generational gaps, right? You know, thinking about individuals who are kind of all the way down uh, that relationship and frankly, legal ops professionals too, right? So how are you then, you know, syncing those individuals up? I think, you know, law firms um, are are talking about this more than they have 10 years ago. Um, I think that they are facing um, 
um, definite challenges in how succession planning works. And I think law firms have done a really good job over the last couple of years. I mean, I've seen this topic come up quite a bit in a lot of the roundtables I'm a part of and COO roundtables and those kinds of groups. So I think law firms are doing a better job at that. Um, but it's certainly, you know, something that's always um, uh, kind of first in our mind um, as it kind of relates to how we work with the client. So that's kind of my my two cents. Yeah, and, you know, I, I would kind of add on top of that too, you know, when you have successful, you know, client relationships as a, as a law firm, it's it's usually because it's it's led well, and you know, part of of succession planning, I think, goes back into you know something that that's more akin to mentorship, and you know, when when you have a successful relationship or partnership with a client, the people on that team generally you know learn kind of firsthand here's how you here's how you actually work with a client better here is how you manage it and so i think they can also learn from that uh, you know I, th I think jared is right that you know firms are certainly starting to take this a lot more seriously uh that, that's certainly what it sounds like to me uh but i think that that ties into kind of how how we as a law firm can have a more successful service model you know kind of goes along with that yeah and, and another another comment too you know Clients play a role in that, right? I mean, you're in the shotgun, you're in, you're in the seat to, 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 to demand some things. And so some things that I've seen clients do that I think have been really good have been, hey, name a successor. Um, frankly, name a diverse successor as a part of your succession plan. And guess what? You know, we want to put all those successors together and put them in a round table, right? From our panel firms or firms that we work with so they can start to meet and talk with each other um, and kind of put the client at the center of, of that. So those are things that I've seen um, that I think have been really, really worked really well across the table. All right. Well, let's, uh, you know, I guess, I guess this, this is probably not a bad segue into this one. Uh, we'll go for the, uh, the second ranked choice here. Uh, what does it mean for a law firm to invest in a client? Um, and Jared, this time I'm going to tag you and put you on the, uh, on the, on the spot to start this one. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I'll take a step back. So um, my role at Barnes and Thornburg covers kind of the um, revenue enablement functions within the firm. So business development rates, pricing, um, you know, innovation, um, legal project management. So kind of that whole kind of, kind of forward facing group that uh, works actively with our clients all the time. Um, so I just want to give that background. I've been there about eight years. Uh, firm's pretty large, in law, 70 firm. So, um, you know, 20, 20 offices across the country, full, full service. Um, so what does it mean for a law firm to invest in a client? Um, I think it means a lot of things. I think it's one act of listening. That's the biggest thing is, is how do we listen to business problems? How do we solve problems that are in the business units? You know, the legal departments are um, there for a couple of specific reasons, risk, uh, evaluating risk uh, for the company, and then helping the business units, um, you know, produce more, evaluate risk, or ultimately serving, you know, the business units of a larger corporation. So for us, it's just active listening, understanding the industry um, that our clients are in and understanding that to provide value that's not really billable. Um, additional investment that I think about um, is there's a lot of time, to be completely frank, there's a ton of time uh, internally with a lot of clients that the law firm just doesn't bill for. Um, you know, there's a lot of time that we do, um, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of educational things that we just don't bill our clients for. Um, and a lot of that can be kind of curtailed as investment hours and investment hours shared back with, um, back with our clients, you know, pro bono, um, getting involved in a pro, pro, pro bono program together, um, getting involved in succession planning together, uh, getting involved in a lot of those things that you would consider probably a value add. Um, those are the things that I look like that I see in, 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 in investment. And we try to quantify that, right? So we try to tag that back to, hey, is there quantifiable hours there that we can say, hey, look, look, this is really the time that we've invested in you and our relationship. And we think you should know about that. And we want to continue to keep investing. And what does that look like on a kind of yearly basis? Yeah, Teresa, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I mean, Joe did a good job of kind of laying everything out. I was going to say uh, martinis and a steak dinner, but um, I think we're talking about something <laughs> a little bit bigger and more global than that. But that's nice, too, um, certainly. Um, but um, no, I mean, you know, I think uh, just to kind of piggyback on what Jared said, I mean, it's really, I like, I like the act of listening um, term because I think that's very accurate. Um, it, you know, it's really meeting the client where they are um, and making sure, you know, you understand what investment they want. Some clients love, love and attention um, and they really want you to be there and, you know, be calling them every other day and for other clients that would drive them crazy. Um, so you've got to understand the level of investment your client wants um, and, and asking those questions on the front end saying, you know, what do you, what do you want? What do you need? Um, you know, making sure you're anticipating their needs, knowing their business, as Jared already said, um, and then anticipating things that they, that the clients don't necessarily need um, and providing them, you know, information that, that may be coming down the pipe related to their business um, and their industry. Um, and then, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, and, so, and there's some clients who we've even gone out, especially if we know there's going to be some big projects going out and, you know, and for a non-billable project, as Jared mentioned, and we actually go out to the facilities um, to, to make sure that we understand the various divisions and exactly what they're doing um, in that particular uh, facility um, and, you know, really getting a feel for the client. So that, that can be a big investment that can, can go a long way. Um, and, um, you know, the biggest thing in investment, I think, is just making sure you're there, you're communicating, you're responsive, um, you know, some, uh, you know, my sense from clients is that goes a long, long way if you're just there when they need you to be there, um, and you turn things around quickly and you get them the resources that they need when they need it, um, and, and you understand their budgeting cycle and why they're providing, asking for projections and budgets and that sort of thing, um, you know, that's something that you can, you really do to, to, to invest in your client is just understanding all of that and then getting them what they need when they need it. Boy. Yeah, and, and I will tie in one thing too from uh, last week when we heard from legal ops and, and you know, the in-house teams, uh, that really does tie into one thing that they said that, that they really do want um, and whether it's called investment or partnering is one term that we use a lot. Uh, it's probably become cliche, but I, I think it, it still has some meaning to it. Um, where, yeah, you, you are actually listening to what the client wants. And, you know, when clients or legal ops say, hey, here's what we need, you know, you, you're, you're actually giving them what they need as opposed to just, you know, kind of treating it like, you know, that oh, there's just another, you know, widget that I've sold. Um, obviously, you know, when we're, you know, this entire ecosphere is service. I mean, it is service-based. So that, that always adds a very different flavor. All right. Well, and you know, since there were a fair number of uh, of votes here on steps uh, that firms are taking for DEI, um, you know, I, I did at least just want to touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, I think especially since George Floyd's murder, there have been a lot of firms and, and a lot of companies that have started taking DEI much more seriously. Um, and and you know, a couple of things about that: there are and, and of course, there could be another session on this. And in fact, uh, we did present one uh, a few months ago on this exact topic. So uh, uh, yes, I know there's an entire session or several sessions worth, but uh, there are a lot of things that, that firms just like businesses can do, you know, in terms of recruiting, mentoring, you know, obviously diversity, equity, inclusion, access, belonging, and I think everybody's, you know, kind of heard a lot of those terms. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind, too, is, uh, you know, these are issues that we're, we're battling as, as a society. And so, you know, as much as any company or firm is trying to do better, uh, you know, make, make the firm or, the, you know, the business more accountable, uh, it's going to be a slow process. Um, and and that's, that's one thing that, you know, many of us who are involved in it uh, of course, at times we kind of run into that brick wall of going, but but that is that is certainly part of it. Um, but like I said, I I think everybody can see that that law firms really in general are are trying to take concrete steps. Uh, I don't think anyone's found a you know a magic bullet that's going to work. Uh, if we did, I think ninety nine point nine percent of law firms would be doing it. Um, you know, if if there were just one easy answer, yeah, we would we would be doing it in a heartbeat. Um, you know, Teresa, Jared, you know, if you want to add anything on that, um, 
but I, I did at least want to, you know, make make a mention of that since we had a few votes. Yeah, yeah I'll just I mean, just I mean, I not I think you you summarized it very well. I mean, I think there are a lot of law firms out there who are trying really hard. Um, there are some who talk about the challenges more than they talk about the action steps that they could take uh, towards DEI. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that there are some firms who are doing it well, and, and I think the ones who do it well really stop and think what DEI means. It means, you know, diverse recruiting, it means diverse retention um, and inclusion as part of that retention. Um, and, you know, really being forward thinking and not just thinking, you know, how do I go out and recruit somebody tomorrow who's diverse to make sure I increase our numbers, but really being thoughtful about how you get involved in the community and diverse organizations and that sort of thing. Um, so five years down the line, you can really be invested and um, have the reputation both as an individual and as a firm in terms of, you know, being that being that go-to firm that people want to be a part of. So that's, um, you know, I think the firms that are doing it well are really digging in, the, you know, rolling up their sleeves and digging in and being a real part of things rather than just saying, yeah, let's, let's set a goal to, to add to our numbers. Yep. And, you know, like so many other businesses, we're, we're you know, throughout really the, the U.S. in particular, uh, you know, the more diverse leadership uh, that you have in, in an entity, uh, not just law firms, but an entity, uh, generally speaking, the more successful that business is going to be because that, that true diversity in leadership and in thought uh, really does produce better business results. Um, and that can certainly be the case for legal results as well when you have diff you know, different legal perspectives. So, you know, I think, I think all of that is, is certainly important. So, uh, all right, everybody, if you will go back to Minty, I'm going to uh, put up the next round of questions. So if everybody will go back to Minty and you should see it updated. Um, again, if you have to log back in, code is on the screen here. It looks like some people are already jumping in. So again, your top, top two of the three that are displayed. And for the fun of it, I'll try and share as the votes are being tallied. Again, with my caveat that it may not share quickly. Hey, of course, it's making me look bad. <laughs> and maybe it's not the questions. Maybe it's just everybody's picking the middle one. <laughs> Oh, this is interesting. Hmm. Or maybe everybody is, is just closing their eyes and picking and ended up in the exact same place. <laughs> I think people are more thoughtful than that. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead. Uh, since, since we have a, a quote winner here, how are partners, associates, et cetera, judged on performance uh, beyond billables? And, and before we, we do this one, of course, one thing that, that we always have to, certainly in these kind of forums, uh, LVN in particular, but in these kind of forums, you know, there, there are some details that because of antitrust purposes, you know, some specifics that, that, you know, we may not be able to answer completely. Um, again, for antitrust purposes, there, there are a few things we have to be careful about. Um, that said, um, you know, we can, we can still hopefully uh, address some of these and, and at least give some, some decent answers. Um, so who would, uh, who would like to, to kick off this one? I could I could start. Um, so how are partners <laughs> judged by on judged on performance beyond uh, billables? You know, a lot of firms um, certainly take billable hours into account. That's a pretty good um, health metric from you know hours input, right? Um, so that's that's pretty common across uh, a lot of the firms um, that you're going to find. But there's a lot of other factors that go into that, you know, practice management, scoring around, you know, are you a good firm citizen? Do you treat others well? Um, you know, all those kind of what I would consider qualitative um, metrics that go into being a good um, human, being a good citizen, being a good partner or associate, 
uh, and others at the firm. A lot of those have to do with a lot of the things that uh, we talked about earlier, right? So are you a good mentor to your mentee? Um, are you a good uh, proponent of DEI? Uh, what are those things that you're doing internally to just, um, you know, be a better corporate citizen for um, the corporation, which is which is certainly um, the law firm? Um, you know, billable hours, it's in the room, Can't it's the elephant in the room, so you got to address it. I mean, that's a lot of firms are looking at billable hour metrics, um, especially for, for associates. I mean, that again, again is that denominator that goes into um, calculus, right, um, as it relates to setting, you know, firm overall revenue budgets. Firms are a for-profit for entity. Um, you know, collections, cash collections are a part of that as well, so it's not necessarily billable hours, but sometimes cash collections. Um, as it looks uh, when they bring in revenue into the door to that. Um, but that's only one kind of piece of the coin. You know, a lot of law firms, they want to look at these other metrics as it relates to how folks are a good citizen, because if they're not, then they're not really good at treating clients well, relationships well, succession planning, mentoring. They're just probably not going to last long at some of these firms that, you know, have these metrics in place. So that's kind of, Teresa, I don't know, what do you guys, do you guys feel? I mean, do you feel like yeah. that's kind of changed over time for, for you guys? I mean, where do you, where do you kind of see the industry going? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's similar. I mean, I grew up as an associate in a law firm. And so um, I think it was much more billable hours centric. Um, and, you know, there's a little, there's, there's a bit of, we want to make sure that our associates have work-life balance too. Um, and so, you know, we know for years and years and years that wasn't even a thing in law firm world. And so we want, we feel like that the best associates and partners for that matter are gonna be those who have some, you know, have balance out, outside of their life and are working well with clients. But but yeah, but the billable hours mark, it's still the easiest uh, metric to analyze whether someone's productive, um, what they're doing, especially in this remote world environment. And um, what, are, you know, it's hard for us to understand what our staff is, is doing, but we can know what our associates are doing. They on their billable hours. We certainly have plenty of set, um, groups um, that are using, you know, flat fees and other bill, non-billable hours models and certain clients are using that too. Um, but, you know, but it all fits together. So, you know, but for associates, I think it associates and partners is a little bit of a separate question. Associates, we're looking, are they building their skill set? Are they getting along? Um, like Jared said, are they getting along with others? Are they being team players? Are they building their skills? Um, do you, um, you know, do, are they relating well with clients? What's their communication level with us and with the clients? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, so we'll really take a hard look at that in addition to the billable hours um, and then start looking at their client development and their marketing. Um, for partners and, you know, as we're moving to more towards, you know, with senior part, senior associates as they're moving towards partners, we're going to actually start looking at the numbers, like not just how many hours are you billing, but what are your personal fee collections, meaning the dollars that actually came in the door for those hours. So then that's where rates um, and that sort of thing end up impacting, um, you know, the, the associates and their performance and all of that. And um, that can get back into the question of, which doesn't look like very many people were super interested in was how origination credit impacts client relationships. Um, but that can also play in it for it as well. And then for partners, really, um, you know, I know uh, for, for some firms, billable hours are still pretty um, high in the mark for partners, but really most of the partners um, at that point are just concerned about partner compensation, which is typically based on originations and personal fee collections. And then maybe there's an additional component for who's actually managing the relationship separate and apart from who originated the client. Um, and then, you know, the other subjective stuff, like, you know, how you're getting along with well others and your leadership roles and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it ends up being based a lot more on dollars, I think, these days at the partnership level than it does on billable hours. Yeah, and, and you know, a couple of things with that, too. A lot of times, uh, partners in particular who are in leadership positions, uh, you know, they will have a lower uh, you know, billables to requirement at, at some firms. So they're, they're just not expected to bill as many hours because they're managing an office or, or a practice group. Um, you know, a lot of times they're expected, you know, in some firms to put in a certain number of client development hours. Um, and, and one thing too, and, and this is probably something that is, is starting to change a little bit more or at least get a little more concrete, but um, you know, for either partners or certainly for associates, um, you know, some firms are giving credit for pro bono work as part of their hourly goals. So, 
either pro bono work or working on DEI committees, you know, things like that, you know, those, those hours are being counted. So it's certainly not billable hours, but it's being counted towards that credit. Right. And, and yeah, on the, uh, you know, since the, the origination uh, is, is very much part of that, I, I think we touched on that one enough. So let's switch over to uh, how are client relationships managed well? And, and this is one, I think this does go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Um, and, and it certainly has a tie in with what we discussed last week with, you know, legal ops and, and the in-house teams, um, you know. Uh, so really, Teresa, either you or Jared, um, you know, some, some general ideas on how relationships are managed well. Um, again, beyond what we already talked about a few minutes ago. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, was, I, I saw this question and I thought, gosh, I would have uh, uh, loved to hear the answer from the, the in-house panel to say, what do they feel like it makes the relationships managed well? You know, I can just say from my own relationships and then managing um, other um, others in the firm and trying to provide mentorship to, to others to say, this is, you know, how you do it. You know, again, like we talked about earlier, each client is different in terms of their needs and their expectations and whatnot. But um, and so you do have to, to figure that out. You have to figure out what their needs are, what they want, where, um, you know, how much interaction do they want from you. But, um, but you know, at the end of the day, um, managing client relationships is just pure um, customer service. Um, and sometimes I'm amazed. I'm like, I don't really think customer service is that hard. Yeah. It's being incredibly responsive. It's being incredibly, you know, communicating incredibly well with your client. Um, and just thinking of it in that vein of it's, it's, it's customer service and, it, and it's managing people well. What would you want if you're, you know, even on the other line of a phone call with somebody you're calling up, you know, American Airlines or whatever. Um, and so, you know, how quick are you to respond to the client um, when you when somebody sends you something? Are you able to get something, get what they need or triage it to the person who can get it for them? Um, how well do you communicate? Um, are you friendly in your communication? Um, are you giving them an opportunity to respond? Um, if they give you negative feedback, are you responding in the appropriate way? Um, and um, even if it's bad news, I mean, one of my practices is if I have a bill that I see that just looks really high and I think the client is not going to be expecting a bill that high, I will send it to the client ahead of time and say, hey, I just want you to know this is coming. And so let's have a conversation about it. If you need to have that conversation, if this is not what you were expecting, let's make sure this is in line with your expectations or fix it. Um, and then that way they're not just getting a random invoice across their desk, um, you know, through performance tracker or whatever, wherever it comes um, to, to, to be able to remedy that. You get to have a conversation and you've opened up that conversation instead of them having to have something, you know, an awkward um, moment with you. Um, and so, you know, so a lot of that never miss, as I tell people, never miss an opportunity to turn a mistake or a difficult circumstance into an opportunity to show the client that you're willing to make it right and you're willing to open those discussions. Um, so, you know, the ones who do client relationships well, those are kind of their go-to go -to rules. Those are all just spot, spot on from a customer service standpoint. The only thing I'll add is outcome driv driven right so are you giving the right outcomes right are those right outcomes coming back you know does do you feel like that you are easy to do business with right so high outcomes easy to do business with that's the customer service you know piece to that um the no surprises right i think Teresa, that's an excellent point and the way i express this to folks is call your clients on things that aren't matter related to you know be mm -hmm. a human, be authentic um, be a real partner to somebody and, you know, let your guard down, right. And have a conversation. I think the pandemic's helped a lot with that. You know, these kinds of conversations over zoom and you're seeing people in their real life. You're not seeing the suit and tie. You're seeing folks, you know, with their kids and trying to get their dog to shut up and all those kinds of things. <laughs> it's a real humanizing element that I think people sometimes forget about. And I think clients that are managed well and the relationships that are managed well have all those components in them. Frankly, we probably have a longer list of clients relationships that are managed unwell, right? So think about all those things that are, you know, you don't like in your own life that Teresa said. I mean, those are, you know, as a law firm, we're trying to teach a level of customer service and push a level of customer service around the firm. And we spend a lot of time doing that. 
Um, and I think over the last couple of years, I think the pandemic's kind of kind of helped that. I think it's it's solidified a lot of relationships for us that I think are very valuable. Yeah, and, you know, this rem this reminds me of of one thing too, and it, it's something that that uh, we've actually done internally for a lot of these support teams is you know whenever anybody who who you're servicing you know any any kind of relationship with or, or just you know whatever kind of customer service you're providing whether it's inside the firm you know to clients um, uh, on a certain level you're competing with every other organization or service provider out there um, you know made mention of of other industries you know we all just as people through our day-to-day -day lives not even just at work um, you know, we, we know the companies where we just go, oh, I can't stand them because it's just difficult to get something resolved. And then you also know those, you know, those businesses where they provide fantastic customer service or there are the ones that are quick to go, hey, sorry, we messed up. How can we fix it? You know, that's the type of thing. Everybody knows that uh, they, they know what's good and what's bad about that. And so, you know, I think that's that's part of the backdrop to it as well. And I, I think this one too, the, the, the actual question itself, uh, do you actually have a good relationship? I mean, that's, that's kind of the key part, that word relationship or partnership, you know, is it actually a relationship or is it just, you know, if it's something that's just at arm's length and, you know, there's not much of a discussion, it's probably not a real deep relationship. Maybe that client's fine with it, but, you know, the alternative is where you actually do have one. All right. Well, let us, I'm going to stop sharing and if everybody would jump back to Minty and let's do another round of voting on a new set of questions. And once we kick it off, I'll uh, again attempt to share my screen in a minute so we can see how the votes come in. Well, it tried and it just didn't. There we go. Okay. Number the number one is winning. That was the one we were debating on before in our pre-call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, still see some votes coming in, but yep, I think I think that one is is pretty clearly ahead. So of course, do firms actively consider how to help legal ops with technology, uh, typically not found in legal ops. And it, you know, to, to set this one up, this is part of something we we discussed in preparing for this. Um, the in case this helps, a little context to the the question, and this was from somebody in legal ops. Uh, the context is that uh, legal ops in, in some circumstances uh, will not have access uh, you know, by budget, um, perhaps in some ways, uh, to some technology that law firms have. And, and so I think a way that we can frame it also is, you know, we kind of look at, at you know, two things. Um, what is software that uh, might help legal ops very directly that, that may not interact with a law firm. And then there's another, perhaps you could say suite uh, uh, or set of software that, uh, you know, we as law firms may have access to that can help legal ops or where we could kind of collaborate. So just to kind of, you know, frame it in that way, I think there's a couple of different buckets that we could talk about. And Jared, um, how about I, uh, I I tap on your shoulder on, on your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, from my point of view, you know, law firms that are kind of cutting edge are staying up to date on what's going on, uh, at least technology-wise that clients are working with or at least have some of the same vendor relationships. So if you're legal ops in-house, you know, talk to your law firm, see what kind of technology they're using. I mean, 
even and I'd say typically not found in legal ops. So like Teams, Zoom, things that Slack, things that are collab collaboration software, SharePoint, things that are kind of the um, uh, baseline software that folks are using and what they're using it for and how they're using it, I think is important. You know, we use a lot of SharePoint technology, a lot of Teams technology, a lot of workflows there or Microsoft Shops. So we use, we use those pretty, pretty regularly. And I think that's, uh, that's something that, you know, we can share back, you know, case studies, what does that look like? You know, I always think about this in terms of, you know, tap your law firms, see what they're using, why they're using that. They're in the same kind of journey that you are, right? So probably smaller team, you know, especially folks in legal ops, in legal ops and law firms and legal ops in uh, um, uh, a legal department. So tap them to see kind of what they're using. Um, second piece is practice software, right? So there's certain software that's very, very, very powerful for certain practices, document automation, um, for one, two, closing binders, closing checklists. There's a ton of ton of software out there for pieces um, of deals or litigation, um, matter management software. See where there's some synergies, um, where those things could be used by uh, in-house counsel. Um, I don't want to get in the whole dashboard conversation because that comes up a lot. Let's build a dashboard <laughs> or whatever. Let's just be real. If you're a large legal ops a uh, large company, large corporation with 300 law firms, you want 300 dashboards? The answer is no, right? You're not going to log in any of those. So, you know, what are you building as a tech stack internally? What is your company building as a tech stack internally? How do you tap into that tech stack? Uh, maybe folks in the legal department aren't using it, but maybe folks in um, your uh, development team are, right? Maybe folks are using Slack, Teams, Zoom, all those kinds of things that could be used uh, for your team to work more effectively well. So I'd ask your law firms tap into them. You know, we build a tech stack, you know, our tech stack's pretty, um, pretty solid on the law firm side. Um, we're happy to share that um, as much as we possibly can um, with folks that are interested in learning about what we're doing. I think a lot of law firms would be willing to do that. Um, yeah, I'll just, I don't know that I have much more to say. I was, uh, you know, trying to think of the ways that we do help um, our clients. And I don't know that we're actively um, helping. I guess we've seen that more as a tech, um, you know, we would be more expensive to help you through your technology on that other than just to kind of advise and have the conversations that Jared mentioned um, right. then, um, then it would be to, to talk to a tech company. But the collaboration on that piece um, is, is good and getting some input. And we certainly are willing to share. I mean, if there's things like, you know, things from practical law that you could pull easily or um, um, Bloomberg, you know, those kind of things, we're, we're always happy to share um, and just, you know, brainstorm through things. And then, you know, there are things like relativity and you know case management software and Jared mentioned AI and Lex Machina you can run some really cool reports and stuff um, and so um, you know so sometimes I think in-house maybe you don't um, you may see the reports that are generated and you're not sure how those might be beneficial for your group um, and so it may just be a matter of having that conversation with the law firms to see is it really maybe it's a law firm thing or maybe it's something that might help in-house. Lex Machina, that's a really good one too. You know, the, I guess the question if I were a legal ops professional would be, hey, what subscriptions do you guys subscribe to in these particular areas? And could we be a part of when we have a new case, right? Could we get a Lex Machina right. in federal court? Could we get a Lex Machina report um, attached with, um, you know, with your proposal, right? Something like that, that I think would be of value, right? So Try to think about little things like that. I mean, subscriptions, the law firms have a ton of subscriptions, you know, see what you can tap into there. And frankly, Teresa, I know you guys at, at, at your firm are feeling this too. A lot of new practice technologies out there, right? Yeah. And that that industry becoming a little bit more mature. It was immature for a long time. There was a lot of vaporware out there. Now consolidation has, has happened and there's a lot of really good tech out there that could be shared amongst both parties. Yeah. Yeah, actually, Jared, that, that's exactly what I was going to throw in there is, you know, also, e even though, you know, we as firms and, and I have a similar role to what, what Jared has, um, you know, trying to keep up with all the technology, I, I'm, I'm pretty savvy and, and I've brought a couple of things, you know, to, to our platforms and yeah, probably every week, it seems I'm like, oh, I hadn't heard of that one yet. <laughs> so, you know, that's one thing, too, that even as law firms and, and even trying to be proactive in a lot of that, you know, sometimes we're still, 
uh, yeah, we're, we're still trying to find, oh, can this one fit this particular thing? I, yeah. You know, it's, yeah, technology yeah. is a tool, right? It does not fix your process problem. A lot yeah. of people chase technology to fix a process problem. Fix your process problem. Technology is just a tool to help it be better. Yep. Yep. Well, and, and and I I have I can confess I many years ago I made this mistake. Um, you know, pick how you're going to do something first and then find the technology that fits it. Don't do it the other way around. And and I have done that. So I, I know from experience, like, okay, here's the platform. And not many people adopted it because that's not how they wanted to work. So, all right. So uh, let's slide into uh, our, our next uh, next vote getter here. How does profitability impact client relationships? Um, so not not too distant uh, second on that. Um, so e either of you, or yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll, yeah. I'll pick Teresa. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick <laughs> Teresa on this first one. <laughs> Um, you know, um, I was kind of going through these questions in order, so I'd, you know, kind of talk through in my mind about the origination piece of this um, already and how originations can impact, um, you know, individuals' careers and, and in a law firm, the partners and the attorneys and how I don't, I'm, I sometimes in talking to in-house counsel, um, it seems like sometimes they don't understand how important originations are. Um, and, um, you know, in some of these other things, um, we didn't mention it, but actually profitability is one of the things we look at when we're talking about partner um, performance. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's the origination piece and how profitable you are. So you may be bringing in, you know, $500,000 from a client and that looks great um, on your book until you realize the rates are so low and it's taking, you know, a hundred people to do that much business in the firm, you know, ones like Sean and Jared in our, in our business are going, wait a second, uh, maybe we, we don't need this client after all. So, so profitability really is we're you know, we're looking at, we're looking to see um, our, you know, how is the firm making money off of this business at the end of the day? Uh, and we have to, we're running a business, we're running a law firm. So as much as we might love our relationships and love our clients and, and all of that, we, we have to make sure that we're not losing money on the, on the client relationship. And so we have to dig in and look at it. The way profitability, the way I see it, and Jared um, and Sean may have a different perspective on this, the way profitability impacts client relationships is if you are pushing your rates down so low and putting pressure on the law law firm to get your rates down really low um, or even putting pressure on them you write off a whole bunch of time on their bills that kind of thing that impacts that person's profitability it impacts the people who are working on the work their profitability and if they're being judged on that in the law firm the next time you know that we get a call from xyz company who's you know pushing down those rates or or, or whatever it may be uh, the highest level attorneys who can get really high rates are going to go i'm so sorry i'm too busy to handle that work um, and so if you're you know, you know, maybe you don't need the, the highest level best attorneys in the firm, um, but those are typically not going to be the ones you're going to get. And so that's going to impact the quality of work potentially you're going to get. Try as hard as the law firm will be to keep it, you know, consistent, you know, quality no matter what. Um, but you, you may just not end up getting the best of the best um, in, in those picks. So, so that's, that was my first thought. There's probably 10 different answers to that question. But Jared, I don't know what, what your thought is in terms of uh, the profitability yeah. impacting relationships. Um, pass. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> it is, uh, like, like, let's, like if we're going to have a real conversation, let's have a real conversation. We're all human. And what will humans do? If they feel as though it's hard to work with a client, right? It's a it's a it's a for profit business, and humans will go um, to where the work is more profitable for them. I mean, I think that's a real thing. And Teresa, you you nail on the head. And I think sometimes we don't understand how that plays out in, in real life. And I think it really plays out, you know. And I'll use this as a as, as an example. Clients want more diverse associates, more diverse partners. We want them to, uh, and, and we want them to be able to, to work on matters. When rates are pushed so far and so far low that those clients are then you know out of balance to other higher paying clients for those rates, it's natural that humans will just move to work that's going to incentivize them more. Right. And you could say, well, that's that's the law firm's problem, the way and in you're incentivizing these individuals and the way your business runs. You could say that. And that's that could be true. 
Um, but we're all humans and that's what, what people do. So, I mean, that's a push-pull relationship that has to be very, very thought out and very, very thoughtful. Um, we want to provide good value and we want to provide good value to, to clients. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all humans just living in the, the spinning globe, right? Um, and I think that's what, what happens is we, exactly what Teresa says, folks will move to things that incentivize them more and that might be moving away from client relationships that are unprofitable. Hey, we gotta put we gotta put bread on the table. <laughs> yeah, and and you know I think one thing too to to keep in mind on that, and and this is one that I I don't know if legal ops or, or in house people if they haven't worked at a law firm and especially uh, if if you haven't kind of gone into the the details of uh, really trying to look at um, you know trying trying to actually establish. Uh, good profitability metrics for relationships for clients for you know attorneys uh, within a law firm it, it, there is no single way of actually defining profitability there are a ton of different ways as a lot of people you've probably heard there's a lot of levers you can pull and and yeah we're trying to obviously incentivize you know good behavior with it um but there are so many different ways that you can actually measure profitability within a law firm. It, and one of the primary things is, you know, the, the owners, the partners are actually, you know, working as well as, as being owners. And, and so when you throw that variable into it, it, it means you've just got a ton of different ways you can evaluate it. All right. So uh, I tell you what, we're, we're getting close on time, but why not? Uh, let's have everybody jump back over to Minty and let's see if we can sneak in one more round of questions here. We may not get to any, but maybe there'll be a, uh, maybe there'll be a top one that we can at least spend a couple of minutes on. Sean, you could do, you could play all those instruments in the background for the next six minutes. <laughs> you got. I mean, I think that might be, That'd be more interesting than hearing us talk. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I would be so tempted to uh, pipe in music. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm for calls where I can't have the dogs barking in the background. Yeah, I come down to my music <laughs> studio. So it's got a little better soundproofing down here. <laughs> But I did not put any disco lights on for this because I just didn't think it would be appropriate. But, <laughs> but you know, maybe I should. Yeah. Maybe for those martinis and steak dinners we were talking yeah. about earlier. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think I don't think virtual discos have quite the same cachet as as an in person one though. It's no. just not quite the same. <laughs> All right. Well, we still have some votes coming in, but um, how do law firms know how to establish rates appears to be kind of the, the top one. And we're all going to pass on this one. Uh, yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> yeah. I'll take a stab at it. Um, lots of market data, the same way legal ops knows how to, uh, in-house knows how to push back on those rate increases, right? So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, um, data in the market, understanding those markets. Um, a lot of rates are very personal for, for individuals and people. Um, they have a lot to do with brand reputation, the brand of the firm, results that we get and drive, outcomes that we get and drive um, overall for um, the firm footprint. But, you know, we spend a lot of time establishing that rate methodology throughout the calendar year. We spend a lot of time looking at peer data, data in the market. We buy significant amount of um, data from um, reputable data sources. Um, we don't, I, I can tell you for, for us, we don't buy a lot of survey data. We buy a lot of data that's extraction. So extracted data um, that's put in aggregate that we can look at um, peer firms. We can look at markets, certain geographic markets. And we take all, all those things into account. Um, as we go to establish rates across, um, you know, our footprint, um, price 
and costs are really two different tables. Um, any Anybody with an economics background will tell you that. Sometimes they do cross over right now is something that's affecting inflation is very much affecting cost to price. Um, that's something that we look at on a, on a yearly basis. Again, those tables are normally never together. Um, but they are tripping over each other now as inflation has kind of creeped up and tripped over. I mean, the real inflation cost for firms is, is real. Um, it's a real thing. Um, uh, so we, we look at that as, as well and, and, and set those. Usually, obviously, we set rates on an annual basis um, and look at what those markets are, look at what rates we're at, and look at where our position is compared to our peers. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how we establish it. I think it's, gotta, it's gone a long way. I think firms 10 years ago, 20 years ago, didn't have probably a rooted methodology in how they do that. I think they do now. Yeah, and, and you know, there's also you know, the, the cost, cost part, you know, there's, there's the market, uh, like Jared mentioned, and you know, there are different practice areas that, uh, or different types of law that you know, if, it, if it becomes more commoditized, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, then there's gonna be more rate, pressure uh, for any of those of you who know, you know, Stuart's, um, you know, value pricing, um, you know, that's another one. If it's something that's very significant, that's, you know, high impact, it has a higher value. Um, so, you know, a lot of times those, those things can kind of come into play. Um, certainly a lot of, of differences in markets. I think everybody knows, of course, you know, New York, uh, you know, DC, some areas of California. Um, what, what's interesting, and I, I have yet to see how it's, in, in other words, I haven't looked around the corner to see how it's going to shake out, but uh, with, with remote working taking on, um, that could have some impact on how markets are treated, um, but, but I haven't seen a big shift in that yet. Maybe we will. That'll, that'll be interesting. I don't, you know, Jared, I don't know if you've seen that yet or not. But. No, not really. Values in the eye of the buyer, right? So, I mean, a lot of this is the value in the eye of the buyer. We're the seller, right? Um, so we're trying to negotiate a fair price for what the market will bear. And then the buyer chooses to buy that price or not. And then it just depends upon, you know, what they feel is fair market value for that particular practice area. Yep. Uh, Teresa, anything you want to add on this one? As, yeah, no. as a practicing attorney with, with your own rate? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, have a, I happen to have a great pricing director. So um, so we, I rely on my excellent pricing director named, having to know, named Sean Gross to make sure that we analyze this. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, it's definitely more sophisticated than it used to be. But you still get anecdotal information. And you know, like Jared said, sometimes it's a matter of the client pushes back and says, no, you know, this, we can't pay this rate, but I'll just, you know, I'll tell you your rates on this proposal are tons higher than other people. And, you know, it's a similar market and everything else. So you do get anecdotal information every once in a while. Um, another interesting area, if you're just like wanting to poke around without all of the sophisticated, um, you know, level of sophistication that Jared mentioned, you can go to court filings. Um, you know, when, when attorneys ask for attorney's fees, I mean, that would be litigation matters for the most part, but um, but they would add, they'll ask for their attorney's fees and have an entire fee petition and, and lay out what the rates are and what the comparators are in the market and that sort of thing. And so anyway, if you have access to uh, Pacer or like Smokina um, or even, even Westlaw, I guess you could you could dig around and find some of that information on your own if you don't have access to all of that, so. All right, well, I see we are up against uh, four o'clock at least here in the uh, in the east. Um, so uh, I guess we ought to wrap it up. So the uh, LVN team, so Colleen doesn't uh, just cut us off mid-sentence. Um, but of course, Teresa and Jared, thank you both very much. Uh, sorry again, Matt couldn't couldn't make it. Uh, but really, uh, very much appreciate you both, uh, you know, giving us your your wisdom and experience. And of course, to everyone who is on the call, we really do thank you for joining us. Uh, whether you got both uh, parts one and part two, or just either one, uh, we of course thank you. Um, if there's any, uh, I, I saw not a question, but uh, Salvador said profitability is an honorable endeavor. I agree. Uh, difficult yet honorable. Um, <laughs> But again, thank you, everyone. We certainly appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we will catch you all soon. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.